While the James Webb Space Telescope has found an Earth-sized planet, but with no atmosphere. Joining me now live is astrophysicist and cosmologist at ANU, Brad Tucker. Brad, good afternoon. So take us through this finding, and but also what does it mean for this ongoing search for life in space? Yes, because this is part of the what we call the TRAPPIST-1 system. The system was originally discovered um, Oh, quite a few years ago. And it was exciting because it had seven rocky planets. And we thought a number of these could have been habitable, being like Earth hosting atmospheres. Now, the closest one that the James Webb, as you said, was just looking at, uh, the nearest one to its star, we never really thought it would be the greatest place to live, given how close it was, kind of like the Mercury of our solar system. But this latest observation has confirmed that indeed it has no atmosphere, or at least such a small atmosphere that we can never detect it, uh, meaning that pretty much if there is anything there, it doesn't exist and really isn't hospitable. So, you know, in those greater terms, confirms kind of what we had that inkling for, but obviously we're hoping more hopeful for the second and third planets. And that's what really we're excited by when James Webb starts to look at those, because those are the ones that are in similar positions to say Venus and Earth, which really should be and hopefully are having atmospheres and habitable. Yes, well, we hope so, because that will may answer some uh, very unsolved questions, Brad, so it remains to be seen. Now, the Chinese moon rover has found lots of water on the moon is actually stored in glass beads. Yeah, it kind of sounds strange, but so you have to imagine, right, the moon is bombarded by meteors. Now, the Earth is as well, but luckily our atmosphere burns most of those up into shooting stars. On the moon, it slams into the surface. When it does, the heat and energy fuses, melts the lunar regolith, the lunar dust, much like you can do to sand here, creating these glass beads. Now, we've actually known about these glass beads since the Apollo era. Um, but the question is always, what do they contain and how much of stuff do they contain? And from the Chinese Chong 5 rover, they detected that in these beads, there's a bunch of H2O locked into it. So when the meteor impact happened, oxygen was trapped. And over time, hydrogen blowing off the sun has deposited and been stored essentially in these beads, creating hydrogen and oxygen in it. And this is really key. If these beads really have as much water as we think it is, which could be anywhere between hundreds of billions to hundreds of trillions of tons of water. This is huge for future exploration on the moon for supporting astronauts who may go there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it would be interesting to see how it changes any future missions as well, Brad. Now, let's move on because a London-based company has completed its space internet project. So are we talking quite literally broadband in space? How will it work? Yeah, so, so OneWeb is kind of what we've seen as this rival to SpaceX's Starlink. And what the goals of these companies and now more are is to provide, yes, broadband internet to the ground. So you could do this a few ways, laying cable all around the Earth. You could do this via mobile phone towers, or in this case, satellites. And the benefit of doing satellites is you can position them all around the world, including remote parts like oceans or low population densities, especially across Australia. Uh, and then your phone or the service connects to it. Now, SpaceX is Starlink. People have a little receiver, uh, and that does it for you. You essentially can be the customer and buy directly for SpaceX. What OneWeb is doing is using this infrastructure to supply it to other companies. So essentially saying a telecom company from around the world, whether it be in the UK or Australia or somewhere else, can use that services to augment their network's ability. So this is going to be a big thing that we see more and more of that kind of changes the nature of data and internet on Earth. It's essentially your provider will be getting that infrastructure at some level from a space satellite with Amazon scheduled to start their network, Kuiper, this year as well. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great news. Now, just finally, Virgin Orbit has run out of money now. It's shutting down. What actually went wrong? Yeah, you know, Virgin Orbit had a lot of promise. It was using a retrofitted 747 to launch a rocket. Uh, the idea being you would save a lot of the energy and fuel needed of the rocket by launching at 30, uh, 30 to 40,000 feet. Uh, and therefore make it cheap and cost effective. They had four successful attempts out of six. Now, that's not bad. And in fact, that happens with a lot of companies. At the end of the day, it just 
it never really became a regular service. And that's the key right now. If you're going to have a rocket company, whether it be SpaceX or what we've seen with Rocket Labs in New Zealand, you need to have regular, reliable service. And yes, people will be patient while you work out the bugs and kinks. But Virgin Orbit really never got it going. And they had this very big attempt of doing this from the UK, their first launch uh, earlier this year. That didn't work either. So it kind of just... They never got it going, and with so much market competition, they just ran out of money and investors. So they're not fully calling it quince, but they've essentially paused trading, they paused operation, uh, and they've essentially laid off every employee. So clearly the end of Virgin Orbit. Yeah, it's the end. Tough in space, tough on Earth. Yep. A lot of uh, problems right now. Brad, good to speak with you. Thank you very much for joining us.